Okay, so next thing we're going to talk about is about emotional intelligence, which is kind of a buzzword. Anyone seen TED Talks on the subject or read books on the subject? It's kind of a big thing. Um, one aspect of emotional intelligence, which is, I think, pretty obvious, is giving yourself time to truly feel what you're feeling and feel what you're feeling about what you're feeling uh, enough to actually settle into, um, I would just say, a sense of acceptance and perspective. You know, something really big is going on, it's stirring up a lot of stuff. And instead of being in reaction or trying to control it, is to sit down and go, okay, who am I in this? What's producing all of this fairly intense, you know, feeling? And am I learning from this in some way? Because otherwise we can very quickly, and I know this is true in my mind, <clears throat> if a lot of strong feelings come up and I can attach it to some process that's got to do with something I can fix or somebody else has screwed up or anything like that, I can spend, I don't know, I don't usually let it go more than 20 minutes just because of emotional intelligence, but, um, you know, I can just spend 20 minutes just berating myself or somebody in my head about how unfair it is or how whatever it is and, and all that stuff. And... Um, Maybe in a decade it'll be under 10 minutes, I don't know. But it's, it's giving ourselves permission, though, to say, okay, what is really going on? How do I really, really feel? Uh, anyone familiar with Byron Katie's work, The Work? Mm -hmm. That's the coolest thing ever. If you're not familiar with that, just go and check it out, because I think that's the easiest, simplest, smartest, most accurate model for just getting to what really needs to be gotten to as, like, as a practice. And no one, no one, anyone totally unfamiliar with what she's doing? Everyone's heard of it a bit? Okay. So, so basically her, and I can't go through the whole thing, but her basic premise is if you're going to go into this, you need to create a, a kind of space and a kind of practice. It doesn't have to be meditation or yoga or whatever, but it has to be a place and a container or a crucible that you are committed to learning from. So you can't just pull out a fortune cookie and read the answer and move on going, ah, you know. Got it. <clears throat> so the first thing that sh her, her practice is about is sitting within yourself, listening to your thoughts. And when you find some thoughts coming into your awareness that you really think are kind of shit, like that's making me feel bad, or it's making me feel bad about other people, or it's making me try and plan out how to manipulate that person to make them do what I want, because we all do that because it's just how the mind works. And the thing that she says is when you really start to see the track looping and that thing getting really, really like, it's me, look at me. Her thing is, ask yourself, is that true? And if you say, oh, probably, then the next question is, is that absolutely true? Like, absolutely the truth. Like, you absolutely believe and would die for that idea. Absolute truth. And if you can say, yes, this is absolutely true to me, then the next question is, where in your body is that compulsion to be that rigid in that direction? Like, where in yourself is that force coming from? And then there's layers and layers and layers to the work. There's couples, groups that get together, so couples can sit down and go through that process with each other and within themselves about what is enough. There's the... <clears throat> there's a lot of ways to go, but I'm going to say man, woman, but person A, person B. It's like a volleyball game. There's these, all this stuff that's flying around between those two people, and they build up ha ha patterns and habits and function or dysfunction <coughs> in relationship. And if you can sit down with someone who you deeply love and who deeply loves you, and you can look at each other in the eyes and say, is that actually absolutely true about this? Especially if it hurts both of you, and both of you are at a certain moment, you're going to relax, you're going to say, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> that's my dad. Oh, I can't believe I bought into that crap. I, was, I must have been stressing out. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Right. So I'd, I'd look into her stuff because it's super, super simple in, in the sense of how you need to learn. <clears throat> and it's no bullshit. Like it's lasering in on exactly where we all get stuck. Pretty cool. So I'm going to walk you through a Chinese medicine version of it because um, it simplifies a lot of misunderstandings about Chinese medicine, but also gives you a very practical series of things to check in with in, in a similar way to the, the work, uh, but using sort of a Chinese medicine model. So you've probably all seen this. I don't know if I can do this this way the way I used to, but I think that's going to need a five point. <sighs> oh, that's really stressful. <laughs> it's a cult! <laughs> So we have what people call the five elements, and that translation makes me want to 
choke on this piece of chalk because the character actually means putting your foot down in a direction in the moment you change directions. Yeah, how that turned into an element and how the energy of growing towards the sun turned into wood. I mean, there's translation's an issue here because <laughs> that the word doesn't mean element in any possible way. But because of most uh, cultures, especially Western cultures, when you look at their traditions, everything's about the five elements or the four elements. So we just sort of hijack that idea. But these are about transitions of movement. Like it's like seasons, they're always changing, you know, amongst the, uh, themselves. So <clears throat> as you may or may not know, we have things like, let's see if I start this right. So we have water and then we have wood. And we have fire and soil and metal, which is a very brand new thing. It's about 3,000 years old. I know that may not sound like a really brand new thing, but this sculpture goes back 7,000 years before it started to end. So new. this is usually actually meant to be air. And um, <coughs> if you're familiar with Chinese medicine, we have this uh, attribution of certain emotions to certain organs. So water relates to your kidneys. Um, okay for kidneys. And it's related to the emotional state of fear and all of its ad adjectives. So feel free to widen that out a bit. Wood <coughs> relates to your liver, uh, L-I-V, liver. And uh, that's usually related to anger. And then fire, which is related to your heart, uh, is related usually to mania or overexcitement or um, so the one translation is uh, excessive overjoy. I was like, okay. <laughs> this relates to your spleen and stomach. Uh, stomach. And usually it's going to be described as worry. Sudden gust of gravity. This relates to your lungs. And uh, sadness, melancholy, depression, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> is the uh, emotional state. And the idea is that if your kidneys, which includes your adrenals, your endocrine system and stuff like that, uh, if that's so out of balance that it's gonna be making you some way sick, you're very likely to be experiencing the emotion of anxiety or fear and all that kind of consequence-driven paranoia thing. <clears throat> and, um, or if you're constantly in a state of fear because you're secretly a I don't know, overpaid assassin, and they finally figured out your identity, and they're coming to get you. you know, well, if you're a badass assassin, you probably wouldn't be scared. Uh, anyway, so if you're living in constant state of fear, eventually the theory is that that could damage your kidneys in some way. So it's not really causal in a very literal sense, but there's an association there that's kind of hard to deny. Because if you're in a constant state of fear, and your kidneys and adrenals were constantly having to deal with the metabolism, all of all of that stress, oh, you know, you would eventually get sick in that way. And it's never meant to be that simple, but I'm just playing this out. So that would be true for all of these things. The emotion can damage the organ. The uh, organ being damaged can produce the emotion. We're all cool with that? Okay, so <clears throat> this is meant for five-year-olds. It's a very simple little easy to see, easy to remember how to draw, kidneys and fear and this and that. Because if this, is a, this tradition of medicine is a part of your culture, not just something you're gonna deal with when you go to a doctor, it's just the way you raise your kids. And this is what you're gonna see in most Western Chinese medicine textbooks because it's really easy to understand and remember. So for people trying to access how Chinese medicine operates, why wouldn't you want something a five-year-old can understand? It's just like, okay, different planet, different culture. What the hell are these people talking about? Let's start with something that's easy to get. Unfortunately, a lot of people in this part of the world take that very literally and take the confidence in the knowing very literally and then stop to stop thinking about it because it's in there, I know it, I can regurgitate it, I can draw it on a chalkboard. Woo. Right. So this is meant to be the beginning of, of a very deep teaching and a very deep practice. Because what this is meant to help us re recognize is that every one of these states, and although they're considered emotions in the sense of how you would catalog it, a person in any of these experiences are in a state. And your response to any state is either going to be instinctual, which is pretty hard to shake a stick at because it got us here. If you're instinctually driven in a certain way, it's because that's the most effective thing that your, your body memory, your memory memory is going to find for you. 
So <clears throat> if you're in any of these states, you're asked to try and dig into the instinctual nature of that state and why it exists. What the hell do we have all this stuff going on for anyway? I mean, wouldn't it be better if we were Vulcans, you know, like, hey, live long and don't feel it. <laughs> Just let that shit go. <laughs> uh, wow, I pulled that up pretty good. <laughs> um, so I'm going to walk you through the instincts, and I'm going to walk you through a really interesting way to understand why it actually is set up the way it is. And the easiest one to understand is with anger. So the instinctual driving thing within all beings that can produce anger is called assertion. letting you think about the word assertion. It's not something a lot of people use, except lawyers. Are you asserting that Fred actually didn't club his whatever? So if you have an assertion, <coughs> a few years ago I was trying to help a friend build a yurt, and I built the jigs, bought the wood, built a platform, we had all this stuff ready to go, and then a neighbor complained and the city showed up and says, you can't build houses just because you want to. <laughs> and I'm like, why not? I was kind of off in the boonies a little bit. I was hoping to get away with it, I guess. So here I am with the assertion to build a yurt. And then there's this person standing between me and my assertion saying no. So I go to the litigious nature of the world. I want to see the bylaws because you guys have screwed me over before in the past with all your stupid rules and you were wrong the last time, so prove it. Or I could get really frustrated and angry with my neighbor because they got me busted and now it's their fault that I can't get my assertion. Right? And I could spend years getting more and more frustrated, more and more pissed off, more and more uh, hiring lawyers, doing whatever, or, and this is an unexpected twist, I might feel completely depressed because I'm a failure at yurt making. Because I'm still focused on my assertion is not being met. It's not coming into being. <clears throat> what we did is we moved the thing like five miles down the road where it's so hard to get to, the city guys would have never bothered to go there unless there was like, I don't know, a murder or something. So <laughs> we got to build the yurt. But it's all about being that bendy, flowing, vine-like being, flowing with the Tao around whatever's in your way to get to your assertion, instead of standing at the gate of the fence going, bring it on, right? Because uh, that's the only way this can happen. If you're, if you're just, oh, I'll get my assertion met, I'm just going to, well, let's try this this way. And then you're staying in the state of assertion. You're not staying in the state of uh, defiance, reaction, anger, frustration, disappointment, or all that stuff. You're just going, fine, we'll just do it over here. See ya. Because right? that's the big big part of life is, can you make that distinction in yourselves? And I'm asking you guys that. I don't, you don't need to answer it out loud, but I'm asking you to ask yourself, are you aware of the distinction between the experience of a, a heartfelt, joyous, childlike assertion and an adult being pissed off about how long it's taking? Or who's in your way? Or what went wrong? Or all that stuff. Uh, so next one I would go into would be fear. And the instinct underlying fear is a state we call readiness. I hope that's how you spell readiness. <laughs> I'm not the best speller. So imagine that you're walking in the mountains and it's starting to get really, really steep. And you come around a corner and there's a scree slope. And you're walking across the scree slope, but every step is a wobbly rock. I don't know if you guys ever had that experience. I almost died on a scree slope. I slid down it and almost went over a cliff. So I'm pretty aware of that <laughs> shaky moment. So <clears throat> if you were to bend your knees and imagine yourself getting ready to play a sport or start dancing or doing anything that's interesting in life, it all starts with your knees bent. Imagine trying to start dancing or playing football like this. Okay, everybody ready? Whistle blows, music starts, and you're like, mm, something's missing. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? Because as soon as you drop into your body in that way, kind of like a kung fu thing, qigong thing, now you're getting ready. When you're walking across a precarious place, it's your readiness that's going to get you through it. Being afraid of some imagined consequences is going to keep you from the readiness you need to to get you through it. So some things in life are literally that simple. I mean, you get the idea of being uptight. You know, everything's, <gasps> you know, it's crazy. So here's another example. So, <clears throat> and today, well, nowadays, it's really easy to make fun of this because it's even more ridiculous than it was 20 years ago when I probably was first talking about this stuff with people. 
And Nelson's a great example because in the winter, which is coming, you know, it's like the San Francisco of the north. If it's a really stormy, icy day and people are coming down the hill and you're sitting at one of the coffee shops on the corners, it's kind of fun to watch the pedestrians try not to get smoked by whatever guy hasn't got the winter tires on or thinks a four-wheel drive is suddenly like better at braking than a regular car. Not so much. And uh, you can always tell the people that are like, got their knees bent, they're in the moment, they're walking along, they're just going to like zig or zag to, to get around what's going on. The person who's standing there with straight legs on their phone, then they hear the, the honking horn, they're just going, because <gasps> that's all you can do because you're not ready for anything. You're like this, the guy's standing, you're probably going to go, oh yeah, grab the guy, move around the car because you had your knees bent or you were ready. Right? Readiness is a very practicable state. Right? I don't see a lot of martial arts competitions like this. Okay, ready, let's fight. Right? So it's just, just an interesting thing to, to put in, in, in the mind because weirdly enough, when you drop your body into your lower limbs, the amount of nerves through your sacral plexus that are necessary to be coordinated in your movement changes the volume of your brain that's now about physicality. Whereas if you stand up and lean on stuff, the volume of your brain that needs to do that is off. So, oh, well, we're completely useless right now, so <laughs> turns back on again, just based on neuromuscular patterning, right? So, keep your knees bent. <clears throat> okay, next one, this is my favorite one. So, you get across the scree, scree slope, because you're super badass at bended knees or whatever. Come around another corner of the mountains, <clears throat> and you see a bear. And the bear does the bear language version of, hey, it's my house. Like, banging its front legs on the ground a few times. It's my house. And for whatever reason, you don't speak bear. It's kind of going around these days. Um, you just keep walking around in the bear's house going, hey, hey, hey bear. Notice the straight legs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the bear decides to say, look, this is my house. Get the fuck out of here. And he puts his hands up and this is bear language for my house. Go away. I got kids. And you don't speak bear, so <laughs> so bear finally says, Pfft. walks up, cuffs you upside the head, rips off your left arm because it's a medicine bear. I don't know if you know this about bears, but bears are inherently medicine people. If you follow bears run, you're always going to find medicines you need. He grabs a big piece of moss, stuffs it in the hole inside of your chest, and walks away with your arm over his shoulder. Lunch, asshole, <laughs> my house. So <clears throat> now, so oh yeah, it's 10,000 years ago, just FYI. You walk around uh, back home and you're living in whatever you lived in 10,000 years ago, missing your left arm. So now you have to come back into your life with respect to loss. So you have to start a fire. I don't know if you ever started a fire with sticks before, but doing it with one hand is a mouthful. Hint, hint. <laughs> Uh, you got to put on your moccasins, uh, screw that, you got to make your moccasins from scratch with one arm, that's a whole new thing, right? And it's just for imagery's sake, but if you've lost a lover, a parent, your self-respect because you did something that, for whatever reason, you're all judgy about or something like that, you're only going to come back to your life wholeheartedly when you have lived enough time with respect to the loss, right? And English doesn't have a word for this that I like. The closest one is acceptance, but acceptance is a fairly passive uh, thing. And that doesn't feel to me like an instinct. It feels to me like giving up. Right? So the word that I use for this in English is called an adaptive pause. <coughs> so imagine if you can, just for the sake of context, that we decide after post-Trump shenanigans to grow the F up a little bit as a people around the world and decide that if a person goes to their doctor and says, I cannot deal with my divorce, I cannot deal with whatever loss I'm experiencing right now, the automatic thing is just take six months to yourself. There's all these mountain retreats you can go to, there's these places at beaches you can go to. Take that six months and see if you're ready to come back to your life wholeheartedly with respect to the loss. If you call them up in six months and say, not quite there, but I'm getting really close. Six more months, thank you. Would that be a waste of money? No, we would save so much money 
And so many people would be not on chemicals because as soon as they got to a place where they're like, you know, I, I'm at my wit's end, I'm adaptively done. I mean, I'm, my, my inner world is just shit. I need a break. So if you can take that break, but make it an actual, active, instinctual, can I come back into the world knowing or being alone with the death of my parents, that they just died in a car accident or something. Until you're ready to come back as you, the rest of us are just going to get a half-assed version, not because you're not great, it's because you're wounded. So sometimes it's a really important thing, and that's an instinctually driven capacity. All traditional cultures have all kinds of things in place for people who need to be in a healing space. Except for all the industrial cultures, strangely. Anyway. <coughs> I love this one. Because there's like bumper stickers that say, worry is a lack of imagination. <laughs> and that's actually instinctually <coughs> true. So uh, we're all engineers in a way. It's like we're all shamans in a way. And we all have this drafting board called ideation and imagination. Ideation is mostly just about thought and, and words. Imagination is more about seeing things move. So if you have something to try and figure out and you're working through the details and you're trying to you know, understand how it all works and what associates with what and whatever, you're just using your imagination. That's what imaginations are for, right? A lot of us being in this culture tend to think that's kind of a childish thing to do. You go and train to be a shaman. Most of what they're doing is imagining you healing while they're singing over you for days in a row. They're just imagining you shrinking tumors and coming back to your, your whole self. Chinese medicine has a slightly uh, more easy thing to kind of wrap your mind around than shamanism because there's, there's charts and drawings and meridians and needles and herbs and stuff. Oh, yeah. But your acupuncturist, while they're doing acupuncture, is imagining you healing <laughs> or else they're just thinking about their Facebook friends or something, which makes them a shitty acupuncturist, by the way. So the more we can use imagination, <coughs> and notice that it's an Asian word, imagination. Anyone got a really good way to describe what that means, just this part of the word here? What other words end in Asian? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Communication. Mm -hmm. Meditation. So that part of our language means a moving interactive relationship over time. You can't be in meditation without interaction and time. It's interaction with thought, breath, posture, very present kind of interaction, right? So imagination is the rolling interaction of, of relationship and connection with images. So if you can use images to pray how the future of your life works, how that big conversation with your ex is going to go, or, you know, whatever, your kid's doing the scary drugs now. Okay, how am I going to do this? And I don't imagine how to do it. I imagine the outcome that I'm trying to create. And then as I see that outcome, like, yeah, we get to be friends, big hug, high fives, it's okay. <sighs> Got to bring it up though. <laughs> and if you're imagining the end effect being that result, that's what you're going to get to. Whereas if you're imagining, we're going to stand here and fight about who's right about the big bad drugs. What do you think's going to happen? Especially with a teenager. They're just going to slam the door. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> so. Yeah, I use that shit. <laughs> I imagine myself going to sleep. <laughs> or, I mean, a lot of spiritual people say that uh, people who wake up in the middle of the night are trying to find an access to spirit when the phone line is not too crowded. You know, everyone's calling God up at you know noon and it's 9 p.m. He's like, Jeez, God, I got a thousand arms. <laughs> I guess bazillions because it's everybody. But um, yeah, but it's just that idea. If you want to have a deep interaction with peace and silence, you're going to wake up when there's the most peace and silence. Anyway, so anyone want to take a stab at what the instinctual attribute of the heart is? Yeah, funny thing, everyone always goes there. <laughs> and I do that on purpose because I'm going to make a point. So you have to ask yourself, is love an emotion? I don't think so. Uh, definitely not. <clears throat> it's, your, it's, your, it's, your it's an instinct. 
It's an instinct and it's a state. Oh, you don't choose love at all. It just takes you over like being possessed by demons. You're, oh. <coughs> You don't choose whether or not you can love your kid, unless you're a psychopath. <laughs> right? So it's a shift of state, but that state has some really, really unique properties in terms of more precise instincts to be aware of. Right? So I don't remember, this is the first article I ever had published in a magazine. It's a long, long time ago, and it was about how love is really about attention. You know, you're attracted to this kind of car, this kind of person, this kind of whatever you're into, because your attention is just, for whatever reason, drawn to that shape, that color, that sound, that feeling. <clears throat> and there's an attribute of attention that in uh, Chinese medicine or Taoism we call it san. And that by itself can be either defined as an appreciative attention, and I would encourage anyone who's trying to enter into meditation, if you're not familiar with it, is to make that your first choice. Sit down, it doesn't matter what you're wearing. You can fart, you can be in a chair, you could be on a couch, you could be lying on your pillow, you could do whatever the hell you want. The question is, can you just sit there and appreciate everything that comes into the space of your mind? Yeah, that's what that is. There it is. Right? Appreciation is a very interesting Asian word, appreciation. Right? But if you can have appreciative attention, and that's your choice, that's like, that's just, I'm going to train my mind to look at everything that comes into the space of mind and appreciate it. It's like, yeah, you, you deserve to be here. Yeah, you've got some cool shit going on, but you don't have to take it seriously or literally, but I can at least appreciate what it's about. Right? So there's an idea about appreciative attention. And obviously, if you love something, every time you bring your attention to it, that whole appreciation of them and their thing and their little dimple and the other things that just, you know, create all those other fun, yummy things that happen, right? <clears throat> but Sung has a completely different translation as well, which is undefeatable focus and discernment. Right? Because once you're focusing on something, you're basically like a big scary flashlight unless you, um, yeah, unless you also include a quality of what am I looking at? How do I move it around? Do I have to cut into it a little bit? Do I have to pull it apart to know its na essential nature, right? So when we look at the idea of love from an instinctual point of view and from a practicable point of view, which is the only reason this is going on, is to afford people a practical thing to do, you're either going to have the big, yummy, appreciative attention moment of like, well, or you're going to have the natural, not a very good at drawing, obviously, but a uh, little sort of furrowed brow. This is an eye with a person going, right? Because at some point, you're going to have to look at the people in your life, including yourself, with enough discernment to see whether or not they're full of shit. Or that particular habit that they have is just completely adolescent manipulation. Like they don't even realize they're doing it. They're just spazzing out in some way. You can still love that person. You're just like, yeah, they, they just are not prepared for this part of their life in some way. And maybe I'll try and help if I can, but I'm not going to buy into where they're going with this because I can see it's crap. It doesn't make the person bad. It just makes them confused or impatient or s stressed out or shocked or something. So this is the idea with this thing, because if we don't have... Uh, a way of being deeply appreciative in the world in a very grounded, earthy, yummy, gurren per kind of way, <clears throat> then the world is going to seem a very disconnected and, and frantic place, creating more mania. Right? If you have no discernment and every person you meet manipulates you and cons you and screws you over, everybody you meet is just the next person who's going to surprise you with their particular brand of bad. So of course we're now now just constantly just on a state of like, yeah. And we start turning our mind towards things that might make us feel special or, or different or, or safe with a sense of mania because we're not coming from a place of deep, discerned, patient truth. We're like, I'm going to run screaming away from all you bastards and go and start a cult, you know, or join a cult or do something crazy like that because I'm, I'm manic. I'm, ah, ah, ah. Right? It's, it's the opposite of being ready, <laughs> literally, right? <clears throat> Way more opposite than, than fear is, honestly. So people are okay with that? The assertion makes sense to you? I mean, in the sense you feel that that's actually a part of your existence, it's a kind of inherent thing. Readiness, you're palpably aware that that's very different than being nervous or scared. And the only way to not be nervous or scared is deal, <laughs> right? This adaptive pause thing, not the easiest thing to make sense of in English, but can you appreciate how, how 
much of a necessity that is in life, especially when there's a lot of change going on. Anyone still think worrying is a good sort of use of your time? Just FYI, play with it. You'll get there. You just have to be playful enough. <coughs> this, this, this is okay to be a way of looking at some attributes of love that, that are, you know, practicable and enriching and much more, I, I know, it's like people are like, I remember there's this kind of wine you could get when I was young, it's called Thunderbird. It was all for people on reserve and it was mostly formaldehyde because they wanted to kill us off. <laughs> Big bottles of formaldehyde liquor. So I'm just saying there's that kind of wine out there and then there's that stuff that's 400 bucks a bottle that, you know, you're Nah, whatever, yeah, oak and cherry and blah. I went to a wine tasting class once where you sat there and you paid 50 bucks to drink like 20 different kinds of wine and learn how to taste it. Like you're going to remember the next day what you learned, right? <laughs> it was a fun day though. <laughs> so this is this idea of just being a more, a more, more mature, detail-orientated, deep, appreciative aspect of love. So we all want to feel this about ourselves. And if not, we should talk. Seriously, if, if deep self-love is not on the menu for you, we need to talk. <laughs> but what I would encourage anyone to do is start here. Make your assertion to be ready enough to take your adaptive pause and imagine your way out of that place towards <clears throat> your ability to actually see yourself for who you are and love yourself. Because that's what we do. I love sharing that with people. Yeah. I'm sure I could do it with like better graphics, but 